I would like to introduce you to three little words that will have a huge impact on how we can educate children. Goodness of fit. Now, I didn't invent the phrase, and I certainly can't take credit for the theory that's connected behind goodness of fit. But what I can do, however, is immerse you in their meaning and their application to enable us to look at children through a different lens so that we can celebrate individual differences of children and our youth. To define goodness of kit fit, I need to acknowledge an extraordinary couple, Stella Chess and Alexander Thomas, who researched the theory of temperament and therefore goodness of fit. They conducted a longitudinal study back in the 1950s and they concluded that there was a reason that children reacted and responded the way they did in varying situations. Now, while there have been many perspectives of temperament since then, they all resonate back to Thomas and Chess's theory. Now, as a parent, I took more of an interest in temperament after my second child. Having one now to compare him to, I became interested in their differences. Why was it that two boys with the same genetics, the same parenting, could be so different? How could one be okay with a change in the routine and yet the other react so strongly? Being an early childhood teacher, I was certainly aware that there were many differences and that children have lots of individual differences. I was particularly aware of the social and emotional differences and emotional intelligence that I needed to be considering here. But even knowing that, it still didn't account for the differences I was experiencing. Why was one child so particular about having wrinkles in his socks and another um, struggling to separate and to settle into new environments. Well, Thomas and Chess taught me it was because of their temperament, the how of behaviour. And now as a parent of five, I am so grateful I have this knowledge. It has given me a different perspective. I find that the information surrounding temperament and goodness of fit is powerful. It gives me um, an option to anticipate problems, determine strategies, and address difficulties before they become unworkable. With the data from the research, Thomas and Chess identified nine temperament characteristics which they used to describe children's behaviour. And children exhibit any one of those nine characteristics in varying degrees. If you could imagine that every characteristic is on a scale from zero to ten, and any child could be on any point of that scale, across any of those nine characteristics. That gives us a lot of different kinds of behaviours to expect. If we consider activity level, for example, a child could be very low activity, being happy to sit, play for hours on end, to a child that needs constant colour and movement, high activity, action all the time. If we consider sensitivity as one of the temperament traits, and that can be measured in relation to sound, light, temperature and touch. How many parents have had to cut tags off a child's T-shirt because of their sensitivity to touch? Or had a child refused to wear something, and not because it was the wrong brand, but because it felt funny? So some children can deal with flexibility, while others need structured routines. Some children adapt well in new situations, while others find it hard to cope. And although the combinations of these nine temperament traits are endless, Thomas and Chess identified three temperament styles. Easy, difficult and slow to warm up. Now the easy child tends to have a real positive approach to most situations. Highly adaptable to change, they're regular in their eating and sleeping, they smile, they laugh a lot. The difficult or feisty child, I would rather use the term high-spirited, tends to be very reactive. They tend to be loud, dramatic, and have trouble eating and sleeping. They take an exceptionally long time to adjust to new, new situations and experience frustration so deeply that it often results in temper tantrums. The slow to warm up child is quite fearful. They're quite shy, reserved, tend to be low in intensity and activity level and withdrawing in new situations. They're the child that's clinging to your leg when you're trying to 
take them somewhere or they're about to face a new situation. I can recall my slow to warm up child starting kindergarten and he would be holding my hand while I'm driving the car. So he's in the car seat in the back and I'm driving, holding his hand because that's what it took for him to feel safe. Now thanks to automatic cars, that was doable. We would have been in all sorts of bother had that been a manual. I can also recall him starting swimming lessons. And he didn't have a fear of water, loved water, loved being in the pool with me, but couldn't bear the thought of doing this on his own. So he would be, I'd need to make sure he'd be in the outside lane of the pool, he'd have one hand doggy paddle and the other hand would be holding mine as I'm walking down the lap of the pool, trying to settle a slow to warm up child, the lengths that we need to go to. So in knowing that we have children across these temperaments, we need to adjust our parenting or in an educational context, we need to adjust our approach to these children. So it is, our how, it is the how we approach children that is the goodness of fit. We provide the goodness of fit by adjusting our sales. And we need to provide a goodness of fit so that we can raise and educate healthy, well-adjusted young adults who can deal with the pressures of living in the 21st century. Now, goodness of fit looks different to every child. It might be a change in their physical space, such as putting a highly distractible child in a low distracting learning space, not near a high traffic area, not near a busy window, not near a busy door. But we also need to consider goodness of fit in how we interact and respond to children. If an educator noticed a, high a child that was fidgety, um, not concentrating in class, Rather than um, challenge them in that situation, ask them to go and do a job. Can you take the lunch orders over to the canteen? Can you take these library books back for, for me? The child then comes back feeling great, they've been able to expel some energy, and they're ready to learn. Why do we have to confine learning anyway to desks and tables? Can we take it outside, across the floor, bean bags? Can children have the freedom to move or go outside for a run? We really need to be considering our responses to these situations, our verbal and our non-verbal responses. Certain temperaments respond to certain communication techniques, certain behaviour management strategies and certain environments. We know this as adults. We know that we're about to have a tricky conversation with a colleague We'll do it differently based on how we think they're going to respond to us. So if they're kind of a feisty adult, we might really think and plan ahead a bit more. So we're providing a goodness of fit. In an educational context, there are many educators who do this already. They accommodate the individual differences and in behaviours of children. I think they do it unconsciously though. It's just how they work. I believe, however, we need to make much more of a conscious effort to understand children and adolescents so that we can understand their temperament and therefore consciously provide a goodness of fit. So, aside from the physical space, we need to do this with our interactions because interactions matter, don't they? I mean, interactions really matter. If you can think back and recall your favourite or your not-so-favourite teacher, and for some of us, that's a longer recall. It will be because of how that teacher made you feel. Interactions count. In fact, interactions, and therefore goodness of fit, count so much that they can actually change the hardwiring of a child's brain. This first image depicts healthy brain development with normal synaptic connections. What happens, however, if a child is stressed, the stress hormone, cortisol, which is normal and we all need a little bit of cortisol um, to get us moving. But when a child is stressed, cortisol rises to unhealthy levels and it interferes with the synaptic connections in the brain. So this second image depicts what's happening to the synaptic connections during a stressed child during toxic stress. Not only are those connections being pruned, they're not repairable. That's powerful, isn't it? And we know that children who are stressed cannot learn. So it is more than just important we get this right, it is vital. 
So if we know that children cope and react differently based on their style of temperament, and that our interactions really matter, isn't it logical that we provide children with the best match to their temperament to consciously provide a goodness of fit that will nurture, understand, support the emotional growth of each child and so that our young children can feel understood, resilient and ready to learn and grow into capable and engaged youth. If we have an understanding of our own temperament and the temperament of the children around us, then we can do this. We can provide the goodness of fit. There is a vast amount of information already out there regarding temperament, but you have to know what you're looking for. My research is telling me that this is not information we're giving to new parents. And yet for those parents who I have worked for, with, those parents that I have worked with, this has made a huge difference to how they have parented. For some it's been light bulb moments. By simply knowing what temperament characteristics their child was experiencing, that their child was slow to adapt, for example, would change the way they parented and their expectations for that child. So aside from educating parents about the goodness of fit and the practical applications that, that can have on a daily basis in their home, for parents having this knowledge about their child also empowered them to be able to advocate their child for their child, whether that be at swimming lessons, starting kindergarten, starting high school. Now, my research focused on children with slow to warm up temperaments in an educational transitional context and how their temperament was considered in one of the major transitions in their lives, starting school. And it really cemented for me how powerful this knowledge is. And I have observed educators providing the perfect goodness of fit, just comes naturally. But I've also observed others that don't do it so well. Knowledge is power. And if we know that children with a slow to warm up temperament react strongly to um, change and are slow to adapt, then we can accommodate this. If, for example, you knew your slow to warm up child was in the home environment, goodness of fit would involve giving them warning time of what was planned for the day. No surprises. You wouldn't expect them to be confident when they meet an unknown adult or with a new babysitter. If you have a slow to warm up child in an education transitional context, then this too needs to be given careful thought and planning. Perhaps consider a familiar face, the role that older siblings might have to play. What does this child need to feel safe and secure? And while starting school is a big transition, and it's extremely important that we are considering goodness of fit, it's not the only transition that we need to be aware of. I have seen children who are quite settled at school become completely unravelled when their daily routine changes, without warning. So they arrive Monday morning expecting to do art at nine o'clock. That's what they've done for the last three months. They're ready for that. They arrive and the chime has been changed and now they're off to library. It happens. But for a slow to warm up child, that can be huge and we need to be thinking about that. You can't ki make that kind of change when you have children with those temperaments. Spontaneity is their worst enemy. And what about the transition to grade one, from grade three to grade four, from primary school to high school, from high school to senior high, and from senior high to higher ed? Do we consider the impacts that that kind of transition has on a child or a young person based on their temperament? Goodness of fit is something that we need to consider and embed in our teaching practice, as important as the academic skills that we're teaching children because without providing a goodness of fit, children cannot learn. Working with a child's temperament instead of against it is a win-win situation. The child feels understood, they're relaxed, they're ready to learn. Parents feel like the educators really get their child and the educators can do what they do best, reducing the number of behavioural problems. Temperament needs to be an integral part of the classroom and our parenting and we need to adjust our practices to create harmony. When harmony exists, we have provided a goodness of fit and optical, optimal learning and development can occur. When parents understand their child's temperament, 
they can provide the goodness of fit, which, as I mentioned, not only benefits the home environment but allows them to advocate for their child. When educators and parents both understand a goodness of fit, children and adolescents have higher self-esteem and learn more readily. It's all about adjusting your sails, dependent on the direction of the wind.